Hello, and thank you again so much for participating in our Teach Out. I hope you have found the conversations uh, very insightful and very informative. And I sincerely appreciate your profound perspectives and your very insightful uh, questions. Um, I will be responding to some of the uh, questions in the forum, but I, I wanted to take a moment here to address some of the questions uh, right now. So one of the first questions I'd like to uh, address is, what do you think about free speech as it relates to people with something to lose? I do think that when people are directly affected by an issue and when the consequences of them speaking out or expressing their thoughts, when those consequences are great, I do think that oftentimes it requires them to filter what they're saying and to be very mindful and very cautious about what they say and how they say it. For individuals who aren't as affected by an issue, they don't have the same constraint or the same pressure to filter what they're saying. And so I do think that there's a difference in the nature of the speech or expression by people who really have something to lose. And you may recall from the conversation that I had with Ward Manuel, the athletic director here at Michigan, it is so important for people who are impacted by these issues to be informed, to be well informed about the issues, to be very articulate so that they can clearly convey the issue. And because of that, it puts a greater onus, I think, on people who are affected by these issues to really be able to communicate their message through the anger, through the hurt, through the pain. So what the audience is hearing is the message and not the residue of the message. And so the other part of the question that I was asked was, do we need greater social and economic protection for those people who do have a lot to lose? And I think we do. I, I do think that it would be helpful if we had something akin to protection like we do for whistleblowers to prevent re retaliation. And so, yes, in answer to this question, I do think that the extent to which people have something to lose, oftentimes it does um, uh, make them temper what they say. Isn't it true, regardless of the pigmentation, all participants in USA sports are wealthy and privileged compared to most people living on this planet today? I think that's a very interesting question, and I do think that most professional athletes um, are wealthy for the most part. Most of them are wealthy, and, and, and their economic capital is far greater than the average American. But the notion of their privilege, I think, is a fluid concept. When you think about the athletes, particularly the, the black male athletes, yes, elements of their athletic status and their involvement in sport and their visibility, it does give them privilege. It gives them access to places. It gives them access to opportunities and experiences that, that average Americans don't always have and don't always enjoy. It also gives them access to networks that the average American doesn't oftentimes have access to. But when the athletes are not in their uniform or not recognized as being an athlete, their social identity, as in, in, in many cases, their identity as, as raced, as a black male, as raced and gendered, oftentimes because of that, they are subjected to the same type of maltreatment that black males are throughout the U.S., you may recall the conversation that we had uh, with our student athletes talking about how privilege is fluid. Um, some of the athletes, because of the high visibility, they're also under greater scrutiny. And so they may not see that as a privilege because everything they say is under attack. Um, they're also, we also know that this notion of privilege, it, it differs in the global space. Some of the rights that athletes have here Athletes don't experience in the, in the global perspective. And so, yes, athletes are wealthy. I do agree with that. But when you talk about the notion of privilege, I think privilege is fluid. And so you have to understand that while they're given privileges, oftentimes when they're not in the arena, when they're not protected by the confines of sport, they don't have the same privileges. You may recall in the news not too long ago, some football player was arrested. Um, subject to the same type of a treat of, of treatment that many black males experience throughout the U.S. So yes, there's privilege, but the privilege is fluid. And we find most of the privilege for athletes, it's when it's associated with sport. But when they're not in the arena and not in their sport attire, they're subject to the same type of social injustices that black men throughout America are also experiencing. 
This question reads, I am of the opinion from the lectures that you believe professional athletes have the right to express political and social stances during or before games. Why do you think that is a right not given to other employees while they are at the job? Or do you feel employees should have the right to express political opinion to the public at large while they are in the workplace? So this is a very interesting but tricky question. I do believe, first and foremost, that when professional athletes, because there's a distinction between professional athletes and collegiate athletes, and you may remember uh, Professor Clark talked about some of these distinctions, but I do believe that professional athletes are representing a private entity. That's their workplace. I do think that they should be representatives of that particular organization as determined by, particularly for professional athletes, the collective bargaining agreement. That's what it's in place for, to provide the governing rules and regulations for their behavior, uh, expectations, rewards, etc. Now, the, what's kind of similar to that is in a regular workplace, we have our HR policies that determine what constitutes acceptable behavior, Etc. So I do think that when athletes are representing their organizations, much like the regular individual is representing his or her workplace organization, I do think that there's an expectation and a code of conduct that should be adhered to. However, in the context of sport, I don't agree that the norms of the corporation can be such that they are inherently political. You may remember the conversation I had with Professor Clark where we talked about the irony where people are complaining about student, uh, complaining, excuse me, about athletes standing during the national anthem, but by virtue of requiring them to stand during the national anthem, it's politicizing. So it, it's a very interesting irony and a very tricky question. Um, but I do believe now, when people are representing an organization, that they should be mindful of the rules and regulation that govern their particular behavior. And when we talk about sport, what constitutes the game? Is it the pregame? Is it only during the actual competition? What happens immediately after the game? Those transitions are very, very tricky to regulate, and that's one of the reasons we've been having this debate and the conversation relative to what's appropriate in the game, during the game, post-game, Etc. So it's a very tricky question, but I do believe at the end of the day that there, if you're representing an organization, you have to understand the values of the organizations, the principles of the organizations, but by the same token, the values and the principles of the organization should also be fair to the person, to the individual, and not inherently making them be political. So another interesting question is, could the university penalize an athlete who put a slogan on his or her uniform as a form of speech or wore an armband in a game as a form of speech, or who wasn't seen as respectful to the speech of all fans? This is an interesting question. Um, you may remember from our conversation with Dr. Andrews, there's lots of different ways in which speech is manifested. Now, this particular question references armbands and, and uniform kinds of things, but there's also hairstyle as a form of expression in speech, tattoos that athletes have, and the number of different expressive behaviors uh, and gestures that athletes make. So relative to this question, first and foremost, athletes have to adhere to the guidelines that are set forth by the governing body. For example, the Big Ten has rules and regulations about uniforms, and as does the NCAA and other governing bodies. But you may also recall us talking about sport as a contested terrain. So what that means is there are some rules and regulations to govern the overall element of sport as a form of competition, as a game, as a ritual, as a practice. But there are also ways in which athletes are trying to find their space. So that's what we mean by contested terrain. There are rules and regulations. And so athletes are trying to find ways within the rules and regulations by which they can express themselves. And so sometimes what we see is athletes may write something on their shoes. Um, they, they may use like, you know, the black eye uh, underneath their, their eyes. I don't know what it's called, the shadow underneath their eye. And there's a message there. Uh, it could be a Bible verse in some instances. In some instances, it was an area code or something else that was symbolic. And so the idea, your question is, can universities punish athletes? Universities, particularly those that are public, can, and you remember from my conversation with Professor Clark, they cannot punish the athletes because they're, they're entitled to the free speech because it is a public entity. 
But you may also remember Professor Clark talked about time and contacts in space. Inasmuch as the expression of the athletes are not violating the code of behavior, the code of conduct, the rules and regulations for uniforms and appearance, inasmuch as they're not doing that, universities cannot punish the athletes. Now, again, it's a kind of a slippery slope because, you know, your question also says if it's not disrespectful. And I think administrators have to determine what constitutes respect or respectful and disrespectful speech. But by and large, Athletes are trying to find ways within the rules, within the confines of the rules of this contested terrain whereby they can express themselves in a way that does not disrupt the competition, that does not violate the rules and the regulations and the code of behavior. So one other issue that I would like to address is the notion that there are no constraints or restrictions for free speech as it pertains to fans. I want to remind you that when fans purchase a ticket to a sport event, they're agreeing to abide by the rules and regulations of the venue and of the competition. So there's a code of conduct and a code of behavior that governs what's acceptable and what's unacceptable in the context of sport. Now, you may remember if you've gone to a sport event and you look on the back of the ticket, oftentimes they're very expensive express implications of what you can and cannot do, or you'll be subject for being removed in the facility. And, and there have been instances where fans have been removed from a sporting event because of the nature of their conversations, their expressions, and the way that they've said things to referees, to coaches, and to athletes. So there are some restrictions. You may also notice in some sport events, uh, on their walls, their banners and signs and placards that tell you what's acceptable behavior and what's unacceptable behavior. So while there are lots of freedoms given to fans, there are also some restrictions in as much as they violate the code of conduct, the code of behavior, the policies and procedures of the event or the particular competition themselves. Thank you again for participating in this teach out. I hope you've enjoyed the conversations. I hope that we've provided you with a little deeper insight relative to the complexities and all the nuances of free speech and sport. I look forward to your continued conversations in the forum. So continue to share your thoughts and your perspectives on this very important issue of free speech in sport.